Good afternoon. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining this session, Ending Corruption, the Recovery of Trust. My name is Pedro Rodriguez de Almeida. I'm a member of the Executive Committee of the World Economic Forum. I'm also the head of the Partnering Against Corruption Initiative. So just before passing to Ms. Furuhar, who moderate the session, I would like to say uh, that uh, ending corruption is far, far from being a straightforward uh, uh, task. Um, the World Economic Forum has been uh, involved in anti-corruption, particularly for this initiative for the past 12 years, and uh, over the years moved from compliance to build trust and integrity. And I think this is one of the key ideas of the discussion today, is the recovery of trust by ending corruption. Ms. Forohar is a global business columnist with the Financial Times. I would like her to please introduce the, the panel. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks for having me here. I'm extremely excited about this panel, actually more than any other that I've done this week. I think it's an incredibly important topic. And we have a wonderful group uh, of people here to talk about it, so I'm going to briefly do introductions. Um, so to my left is Minister Sapin, the Minister of Economy of Industry and Digital Affairs for France. He'll be speaking in French, and you all have uh, your devices here um, when you need them. Uh, to his left, Guy Standing, who is at the University of London and is the author of The Corruption of Capitalism, which puts forth uh, a thesis about this topic that he's going to share with us. David Cruikshank from Deloitte, uh, who is going to speak so uh, somewhat about the history of uh, corruption and, and other topics. Kobus Deswart, who is head of Transparency International, which has done so much around this topic for so many years. Uh, and Vijay Shakar Sharma from Paytm, which is an Indian-based uh, firm yeah. uh, that uh, deals with digital payments and is looking to, to basically take uh, the economy away from cash as a, a way of dealing with corruption. So. Let me just set the stage for a moment. I mean, in some ways, this, this topic, particularly after the last year, needs no introduction. But um, institutions are having a trust crisis, you might have noticed. Um, uh, political institutions, um, government, business, uh, NGOs. Uh, there's a piece of research that probably some of you know is released every year in Davos, the Edelman Trust Barometer. And it's, it's actually quite a good study. Um, last year's uh, survey was, was pretty bad. They found that uh, mass populations had less trust in elites than ever before even though elites themselves trusted themselves more than ever before. So talk about a gap, you know, and I'm, I think that that's who they're talking about. We're sitting in this room. Um, but this year, trust fell even further, amazingly. And, you know, I have to say, my own industry, media trust plummeted the farthest, um, you know, which is not surprising given the fake news scandals, um, just the sort of toxic nature of the social media sphere right now. But basically, all institutions are suffering. Um, and in some ways, we know this is a response to 2008, uh, the financial crisis, which I would argue and did argue in my book, Makers and Takers, The Rise of Finance and the Fall of American Business, that was not properly dealt with and that we're still, still dealing with the aftermath. Um, but it's also a reaction to things like the Panama Papers, um, uh, to, to nationalism, uh, to growing populism, to the elections that we've seen in the US, to Brexit. Um, there is clearly a lot of anger and a lack of trust. So we're going to take the next uh, 30, 30, 40 minutes or so, we're going to have a conversation amongst ourselves, and then we're going to open it up to the audience, and you all can uh, ask questions and take the topic in any direction that you would like. Um, so, Kobus, I'm going to maybe start with you, because I thought that um, you know when we were speaking, you gave me a, a really interesting post-2008 perspective of what happened. I mean, we all put a marker at the financial crisis. We all sort of wonder, at least I wonder, why wasn't this an incredible change point? What happened? Why are we now, eight years on, still having a crisis of trust, and arguably in some ways in worse shape than we were then? Thank you very much. I think if you look back at the uh, financial crisis, uh, at the time it happened, everybody agreed that there was a breakdown of integrity in our global financial system and that that had a ripple effect that was quite dramatic. Mm. Uh, yet if we fast forward over the years, uh, we had a lot of technical issues addressed, but essentially uh, the business model of the financial sector stayed the mm. same. Yeah. And yet at the end of 2015, the world probably came together as never before with Agenda <clears> 2030, <throat> um, including embedding for the first time corruption into uh, the sustainable development goals. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of optimism mm. at, at that time. 
2016 indeed saw a dramatic turnaround and you had a very much, not only in the US or in the UK, across the world mm. you could see a disillusionment and a breakdown of trust of populations where the anti-establishment and anti-elite sentiment is very much one that those peoples that make the rules mm. are then the ones that disproportionately benefit from them. And they're the Panama Papers and this excessive anti-social uh, secrecy surely added to it. Uh, whilst we should uh, uh, be cautious not to say these are all just uh, outcry of the inequalities that we see Clearly, that helps to fuel this. Mm. And maybe uh, one should also keep in mind that when you look how much governments invest to get an economic growth rate of 3 or 4%, mm. and at the same time, the amount of illicit flows, the amount of corruption that is facilitated is conservatively estimated to often cost economies between 5 and 20%. Wow. And then you say, why don't we make a greater effort there? And I think, so if you look at, at breakdown of trust, it is also because not enough is done mm. uh, to actually address the root causes of a system that suffers from a lack of accountability. That's a great frame setting, and I'm interested in what you say about the amount of money the governments are spending to get a fairly lackluster growth rate by historical standards. And so, Guy, I might, I might turn to you. Um, governments have poured, actually central banks have poured tons and tons of money into the economy um, over the last eight years, something like $25 trillion, in part because governments weren't able to act, but the result has actually been an asset bubble that has enriched the top 20 percent of the population that owns 80 percent of the assets. Um, you have ideas about the, uh, the elite and this sort of rigged system, put forward your thesis and, and tell us... Uh, well, I'll this. come to the central bank question because I think that's really part of the corruption of capitalism. The decision by governments to make their central banks independent of democratic control mm. and to be <clears throat> able to develop monetary policy when they're being run by financiers, mm. many of whom happen to just have been employed by Goldman Sachs, but that's a pure coincidence, <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, when you do that, and then you authorize them to do things like quantitative easing, which pours money into the financial markets, to the financiers, the very people who were responsible for the financial crash, as many banks have been found guilty of fraud and various other things, and yet you give money to those people. That's part of my thesis, mm. which is that essentially what we've seen develop, particularly over the last 25 years, is rentier capitalism, mm. where the returns to property, and in particular intellectual property, have mushroomed out of control. Mm. This is a contrived situation where the rental income share of global income has shot up. And the corruption begins by the politicians and chief executives, let's be honest, saying they are in favor, in favor of free markets, they are in favor of free trade, they are in favor of competitiveness, and at the same time they are constructing a system which deliberately restricts free markets free trade, etc. Mm. And above all, the passage of TRIPS in 1995, trade-related aspects of property, has resulted in a huge increase in patents and copyrights. And everyone should realize that there are now more than 10 million patents in force and a huge number of people waiting to file patents. And the value of the stock of patents at the moment is estimated, and it's a very rough estimate, about $16 trillion. Mm. Now, patents are something that you give the, a monopoly right mm -hmm. to an individual or corporation. So you take something out of free market competition. Well, you either believe in that sort of system or you believe in free markets. Mm. But don't stand up and say, we are in favor of free markets, and at the same time strengthen your intellectual property rights system. 
It's in, 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 and I want to end on this particular subject because the, the cherry on top of the cake, which is what I, one of the most undemocratic institutions that you could possibly imagine, is the ISDS, the Investor State Dispute Settlement. It allows multinational corporations to sue governments for compensation into hundreds of millions of dollars <coughs> if, in the multinational's opinion, the government is making any reform that will affect their future profits. Mm. Now, can you imagine as an individual citizen being able to sue your government for any policy that affects your future income? We'd be very rich overnight, <laughs> or there would be par paralysis. But that's the reality of the ISDS, and they, they even have the privilege of appointing one of the three judges, the other judge, second judge is appointed by the government, and the third judge, the multinational, has to agree. Now, this is institutional corruption, hmm. because who, who wins all the cases? And what has happened is that hundreds of millions of dollars have been won through this process. And they don't have to follow due, due process, precedent. It's all in secret. And that is a sort of cherry on the cake. And when you say trust, you have to think about those institutional mechanisms which are, have been built up in the last 25 years. That's okay. the first point. OK. Um, great, great thesis. And I'll come back to you and dig into <coughs> parts of that. But now I want to turn to the minister and ask, um, you know, as, as a representative of government, do you feel capitalism is in crisis? And then perhaps you can speak a little bit about uh, your namesake law that's been passed uh, to try and fight corruption in France um, and, and tell us how it came to be and what, um, what you think it could do. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. I am sorry for uh, speaking in the French language, in Molière's language, but um, I am sure that you will be able to follow my speech. I am very interested by what has been said. Of course, those are global reasonings that are trying to analyze in time and in depth the causes of corruption. But when you're in a political responsibility as I am, my goal is to be efficient as quickly as possible. Efficient against corruption. We see how damageable corruption is. Corruption for our institutions, for the trust we place in our institutions. It feeds defiance in democratic countries, but also in countries that are emerging right now. It is also very serious from the viewpoint of development in countries that are emerging, because the fact that the very structure is corrupted, the fact that there is a lot of money that at the end of the day comes to um, economic or political decision makers is less money for uh, the state. And in those countries, every single dollar counts to allow for development. And when it comes to the good functioning of our capitalistic societies, whatever the name of the political regime that is making sure that those economies function, I think there is a damage from the economic viewpoint as well. Why? Well, because we have uh, uh, corporations that are in a real uh, competitiveness, trying to bring the best service at the best price, and another corporation will win because it won the trade, the tra the the public tenders thanks to other methods, damageable methods. And of course, it's a perversion of all the goodwill in the will to produce uh, for companies also to win money, but to do it in a transparent and an honest way. This is why we need to act. And acting is my role. What is our action? And I will conclude with this. Well, first and foremost, we need to act in order to make sure that in our countries we have rules, provisions, procedures, institutions that are efficient and Swift. Being swift is very important because a fact that is identified one year and condemned 10 years later, it's not the same as if you identify it and you condemn it six months or 12 months afterwards. Second point, and I will conclude, it's uh, international, the international viewpoint, and my law has this objective. Uh, 
provide France and other countries the right tools in order to fight against corruption, thanks to French corrupt or, or making sure that French corporations abroad and in France will not be corrupted. And I believe that this is uh, absolutely needed. Those are quality tools. France actually had a bad reputation. Transparency International makes a classification in France was at the middle. It was not acceptable. We need to be at the very top of fight against corruption. And this is what we are doing. Let me conclude by the need for international cooperation. Fighting international corruption without international cooperation is not working. Therefore, we need to have at the level of the G20, at the level of the IMF, at the level of the various cooperations in large regions such as Europe, we need a real cooperation in order to be efficient. Let me ask you one follow-up question. Um, I, I'm, I think that you make a very good point that you have to have international cooperation to really get any of this done because there's so often a race to the bottom and in sort of an arbitrage of different national systems. Where do you see the low-hanging fruit to, to help overcome that problem? I mean, how can we really get countries together on things like tax evasion and fighting all kinds of corruption? Um, you know, the trans, there's a transatlantic battle going on about this right now, and it's not always uh, helpful. Well, I understand perfectly your remark, and at the same time, I try to be as optimistic as possible in our collective capacity to move forward and to make progress. Since 2012, we have meetings at the level of the G20 on this very topic. Up till now, within the G20, it was very simple. If you start it, then I will follow. Uh, that was a process, and basically, we were always waiting for someone else to start. As from 2012 on tax evasion, and as from 2013, 2014, when it comes to fighting against aggressive tax optimization, and as from 2015, 2016, fighting against terrorism funding, because corruption, let's remember it, it also allows funding of terrorist movements with all the consequences this can have. So we had three phenomenon that accumulated, and this means that at the level of the G20, at the level of the OECD, we made real progress. So the only way is not to go for arbitration. It is not necessarily to find a median way, some sort of compromise. There is no possible compromise when it comes to corruption. We need procedures. We need information exchange between the various administrations. We need a better trust between the judicial systems of all countries, because sometimes you need to be working at two con in two countries at the same time in order to exchange information and be efficient. This is the only way to decrease. Uh, corruption. Thank you. Um, <coughs> David, let me turn to you now um, for a moment. And um, I want to ask you sort of two questions. Um, first, I want to get your historical perspective. I know you've done a bit of a historical study on corruption. And you know, if there are any lessons from the past that you think are particularly relevant to the paradigm today, love to hear those. But also, um, I want to ask you about the business role uh, here. Because in, it, it's interesting to me that actually trust in business has, has fallen less than in other areas. So arguably, it's a really great time for business to be taking a lead on this topic. And yet, you don't see too many CEOs really stepping up. So maybe you can address both those points. Two very big questions, and as probably everybody here has gathered now, there are many different views on how to solve this issue. I mean, ending corruption is the title of the session, and it is very complex. And I, just to give some historical perspective, I mean, we've had these problems as long as records have been in existence. So in the Roman Empire, uh, the elite, the rich elite, used to pay levies to avoid paying their fair share of taxes. So they paid a one-off fee as a bribe, and then they avoided, avoided evaded. Uh, paying their proper share of taxes. The generals who, 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 who ran platoons also used to collect monies, allowances for dead soldiers. They never used to declare when the soldiers died, so they could still collect the allowances. And equally, even for the alive soldiers who were working, they collected the allowances but didn't pass them all on. They skimmed a bit off the top for themselves. Now, all of you could think about the modern-day parallels to those stories, but that was in the days of the Roman Empire. In my own country, the UK, um, yeah, every century we've had corruption scandals, and uh, we had new legislation in the 16th century, the 17th century, the 18th century, and every time there's a scandal, Parliament would react. But it wasn't until you know, 1985 that formally insider trading 
mm. uh, was illegal in the UK. Mm. And then, of course, we had the big beast of the, the Bribery Act, which really has got a lot of force and is making a huge difference in 2010. <coughs> so I think, I think you know, this isn't easy. I, I co-chair the um, Apache Vanguard Group, and we had a meeting this morning with, with governments and with business mm. leaders. And uh, you know, each country is experimenting with its own mechanism. Each country is trying to fix the problems. But there is still a long way to go, I think, in terms of a, uh, you know, the, the best practice techniques and understanding how to, how to apply it. I think business is taking your second question. I think business is, is, is stepping up. Um, yeah, we have the, the, the Apache Vanguard, which has a number of uh, uh, multinationals signed up to adopting best practice, to having clean supply chains, to uh, making sure that they have a zero tolerance policy within their organizations where there are problems. Um, you know, there are many, many well trailed examples of bad practice in the past. I mean, one very prominent company that was subject to much regulatory inspection after it fell into problems had a fantastic ethics guide, but the board excluded the finance director from it on two occasions to give him some operating room. <laughs> Now, you, you, you know, the tone from the top in business is yeah. absolutely key. And I think, actually, that uh, I would say that business leaders the world over, they recognize that. They know that the tone at the top is really important. I'm not saying every business is perfect. That's not the case. But, but most responsible <laughs> businesses really take this very, very seriously and do put it high on their agenda internally. They have got great whistleblowing regimes. They have got zero tolerance policies. They tend not to go out and talk a lot about it because there's always embarrassment when you've had to fire a senior executive or you've had to pull out of a country because there's been some problems with the the, the, the local business or something <coughs> like that. But but I think there's massive change taking place in companies to uh, you know to, to improve the way they do business. I think the the challenge is sharing that best practice with government, sharing it between companies across industry sectors, and that's one of the things that we're, we're, we're doing at the Patchy Initiative. Mm, mm, okay. Um, all right, Vijay, let me turn to you. Um, you have an interesting idea, uh, this idea that if you actually sort of get away from a cash economy, that you could go uh, a fair way towards uh, fighting corruption. It's something that um, Ken Rogoff, the economist from Harvard, actually just wrote a book about, yep. um, which was very interesting, and he made a pretty persuasive case. So tell us about your business what you do, and you know, if you have any metrics that support yep. this idea, that yep. would be great. Yep. In fact, uh, let, me, let me give a little bit of context about India, and uh, I think it is going to be the case for most of the developing countries, especially when there is a new developing event happening and new licenses being assigned or new businesses are being built, that is a time when there is a significant discretion available on government, bureaucrat, or someone, whether it is at a part of policy making or whether it is a part of assigning whom you're picking. And that, that that is the starting point in developing countries, and that is why, like we heard, uh, even if uh, there is a free market, there is an advantage situation if you become part of the uh, value creation or asset that is being created shared that way. Um, India has a layered corruption problem there uh, on an on a extreme low level. If you want to meet a bureaucrat, you have to give money to a PM so that you can get a, a ticket inside. Even if you have an appointment, he won't tell you that this person is inside. It starts at that le low level, like a dollar has to be given. It's, it's a part of an obligation. I was in Kerala state, which is south, southern India, and we had this ferry which was taking us from one city to other city, and there was a money obligation that was to be given so that this gate can be opened. Otherwise, this guy will slowly open the gate. So I'm talking about a dollar or a two corruption size, and, and then let's layer it to the middle layer, mm -hmm. where uh, a, a business wants to get funding done, and business wants a loan to be assigned, and assets to be created in a bank, and those need to be approved. I mean, there are cases. This is exactly where the NPAs got created, and Indian uh, regulators sort of became stringent about it, that whom are you giving loans, and so on and so forth. Those restrictions came in place. And finally, there is an equity kind of uh, corruption where you share equity with some family and so on. Now, in all this, uh, some of those things that you're noticing here, uh, in India, most of this happens in a cash way. 86% of India's trade, I mean, the currency notes are the... Uh, are, are the businesses happening in currency nodes? And not, not all of that gets recorded anywhere. Mm. It doesn't even get reported as to the bank. The money keeps circulating and this box full of cash, they get uh, put behind in a house or somewhere, but they are not even to the formal banking system. So demonetization was an intention of our prime minister mm. to attempt that if you own some, you have to come and declare, otherwise this is dying. 
I, I, and, and uh, anecdotally, I won't share. Uh, some of the politicians who had low, who had lot of such cash, and it doesn't mean that only politicians had it, but many other classes had it. They quickly found an idea of lending this to the poor citizen and saying, "You go and deposit this money." Because I'm giving you, I'm giving you as a loan, and you will give it back to me when the new currency note comes. All the sequencing told us, all the sequencing told us that the probably, I mean, this is an early step. So let's not say this is the final step or ultimate answer. Uh, having a trail of the money having a digital trail of the money, and who is transacting this money to whom, that trail of the classic blockchaining, the transactions, yeah. and sequentially taking care of the register, is probably going to be a, at least one of the dampener for these people who are taking and holding cash. Mm. And that is exactly the reason that <laughs> we, as a Paytm, which is pay through mobile, uh, built a business model around uh, very low transaction money uh, to a very high transaction money. So when you are on a place where you're paying, let's say, a 10 rupee or a 20 rupee, uh, a small shopkeeper who otherwise never opened a bank account and never ever bothered about uh, taking this money that he was receiving into a formal economy. Mm. So digital, digital was the way that we believe the mobile payment that created a trail of the money, which over the period, if you're doing a genuine business, there is nothing wrong about it. But it, it, it created a lot of uproar in the country mm -hmm. because not just uh, corruption, which is uh, intended to be, let's say, who gets an advantage. In India, it's an amazing country. Uh, only f 5 million of 1.2 billion people, only 5 million people ever file a tax <coughs> where there is one rupee given to state as a tax. In a country of 1.2 billion, only 5 million people ever gave state one rupee of tax, which means, again, the digital. This is like a corruption at a mass level. I mean, uh, <laughs> you're talking about it is not, uh, I mean, we are a God-fearing God country. We, are a, we want good of the world. But when it comes to government, hold a minute. That money is ours. <laughs> just, just let it remain here. So you can understand that a country, for a country, it is a very different way we have to come out of corruption. Mm. It is a very different way. And I think digitization starts that there will be a trail and somebody can say, hello, knock, knock, do you realize that you have to file a tax because you had an earning? Or you had an earning in a way or a pay, a mm. payments that you did. Can you tell me how did you get that? Yeah. So digitization, we believe, is a starting point or removal of it. OK, very interesting. Kobus, I want to ask you to just comment. Do you think that um, a cashless economy or technolo technological move to uh, something where you know, you're using less cash would actually go a fair way towards helping corruption? Well. Uh, uh, I'll answer it in two ways. Mm. Uh, of course, uh, we have to recognize that poor people across the world are most vulnerable uh, for extortion because often what we know, the percentage of their incomes that they need to pay, so although it's small amounts, uh, are, are very huge. So dealing with that most definitely is a major part of the problem. At the same time, when, when you take the, the, the global view, the illicit flows and corrupt flows around the world are, in, in other words, grand corruption, are really the ones that impoverish countries dramatically. Mm. In, in the case of my own continent, Africa, today the, the outflows through money laundering, corruption, illicit flows, are seven times that of financial inflows wow. through trade and aid into Africa, wow. which means that the wealth stripping of Africa today is worse, is worse than during slavery. Amazing. And, and that is not through petty corruption. That's through grand corruption, and that is through digital flows. So, so one, one has to there realize that digital is absolutely part of the answer. But at the moment, the one of the risks is that a digitalization of money flows could actually uh, mm. benefit from exactly a system that is very skewed as it is at the moment. And uh, the, course, the, the optimistic part of that is that uh, once you start to deal with digital flows, they leave digital trails and surely the same tools that make illicit flows possible mm. also make it possible to actually trace them. Mm. But, but uh, it's a little bit as if we've created the self-driving car <laughs> 
<laughs> but somehow uh, the car had some other major flaws, such as uh, that the, the, the engine jobs. doesn't work <laughs> properly. So it can drive by itself, but the engine will break down on, on the highway. And, and I think we, we need to bring there the technology and the political uh, will yeah. together much more. That's a, that's a great point. Um, Guy, I want to turn to you for a minute because in some ways all of this dovetails with a topic that you mentioned in the green room about sort of a crisis in democracy uh, and, and how that is part of the corruption conversation. Maybe you want to sound off on that a bit. Yeah, before I do that, I, if I may, I just Please. respond to one point. We've been um, exper experimenting in India with a basic income scheme where we provided thousands of people with a monthly basic income. Initially paid in cash and then paid through bank accounts. And now with the RDAR and digitalization, it will work much more efficiently. But one of the things that we saw when we introduced the basic income, and thousands of men, women, and children were receiving the basic income, is we found that the emancipatory value was greater than the money value. Mm -hmm. We found this very strange. And one of the reasons is, is that in rural India in particular, and in many other parts of the world, the developing world in particular, money is a scarce commodity. And any scarce commodity drives up the price. Mm. So the price of money in rural India, the money lenders rub their hands. And they can charge 50%, 100%. Mm. They do, mm. exactly. And I remember going to the villages towards the end of the pilot, and I asked, is everybody, what are people's views? And many of the villagers said to us, the people who really hate your scheme are the money lenders. <laughs> now, I'm very pleased about that, but I mean, I think there is, I, I tend to agree with many of his perspectives. Now, I think the point you asked me about, I think is central to the, the, the whole debate from my perspective about the corruption of capitalism. Mm. Because what's been happening over the past 25 years, in a nutshell, is the commodification of politics. Yeah. Okay? Enough. Politics in all its aspects. Now, you take lobbyists. Billions of dollars and pounds are spent by lobbyists to governments, mm. right? Many of the corporations <coughs> represented in Davos spend millions lobbying. They're not doing this for the sake of using up money, right? And it's been shown by research that the more a company spends on lobbying, the lower the tax that it pays. Well, I wonder why. <laughs> I mean, it's probably a pure coincidence. Right. Now, you've got the, the commodification of politics taking place through public relations companies running elections. Mm. Now, I, I'm, I, I'm British, but I don't live in, in the UK, but the last general election on one side, the Conservatives, they had an Australian paid millions to run the campaign, and he insisted that he would determine words that were used, etc. And on the other side, they had an American running the campaign. So two mercenaries running the <laughs> campaigns, determining what was said. And the, the, uh, the American didn't do as well as the Australian. Come Brexit. The Remain campaign employed the Australians plus an American as an expense, paid them millions. And the Leave campaign employed some other Americans to run the campaign and invent their lies that they told. Mm. So when we all correctly deplore what's just happened in the US elect presidential elections, we should look back in the mirror at what's been happening elsewhere mm. as well, because it's the same in Ukraine, the same yeah. companies, yeah. the yeah. same Americans and Australians are involved in selling the, camp the, the, the presidential candidates. So you've got a commodification, and that's intensified, of course, by the ownership of the media mm -hmm. and the manipulation of that. So I think people don't trust <laughs> the elites to run right. politics. And that's what we've seen with, with Trump. And it's a, it's a central part I of actually, the whole thing. I, I want to share an anecdote, in fact, from my book, which plays um, directly to this point. Um, I, I did a book about financialization, and part of this was the problems that we've had in the U.S. re-regulating the financial system in the wake of 2008. And as part of this, I did an interview, an off-the-record interview with a former um, uh, Obama administration official who'd been very intimately involved in the bailouts. 
And um, just to your point about how deep money politics is embedded and the cognitive capture that that creates amongst the elites, um, I noted that 93 percent, this is an, ac an academic doing God's work, had collected all the public meetings and who, they'd been, who, who had been taking meetings about the regulation. 93 percent had been done with the largest banks. So you have the, a group of people who are going to be regulated taking most of the meetings about the regulation. And, and the official was insisting that you know things had been done properly and that they'd gotten done what they needed to do with the regulation. And I said, well, how is that possible when 93% of the meetings have been taken with the biggest banks? And he said, with true kind of surprise, well, who else should we have spoken to? And that's sort of to your point. So with that, um, maybe, Minister, I'll turn to you and ask, how can we get this, um, this issue of money politics and, and cognitive capture out of the public sphere? How can government kind of you know, take back charge, um, particularly at a time when so many governments in the Western world, particularly, are you know, debt beleaguered, you know, fighting nationalism in your own country? This is certainly an issue. Well, I will try not to be a commodity for uh, money powers by uh, taking the floor in front of you right now. I believe that the first thing is will. We need to want it, we need to decide it, and of course we need to implement it. Of course this goes through dialogue by being transparent towards various groups or towards various co corporations, but never should we depend from the arguments of corporations themselves. Let me come back on another aspect about transparency, given that Transparency International is with us today. The issue of lobbies, lobbying. To me, someone who wants to make sure that their interests are represented is not a problem to me. What is a problem is when they are doing it underground, without saying it out loud, without people knowing it, without um, showing the different contacts and without politicians talking about those contacts either. either. So in the Sapin 2 law, we have implemented a transparency that already exists at the level of the European U Parliament and in other countries. You cannot be a lobbyist if you are not on a register, if you did not give your name. And as a politician, we are not allowed to have contacts with someone who is not on this registry. And also, when it comes to transparency about the amounts of money that are invested in a lobbyist con campaign, for instance, we need to make sure that clarity will allow us to avoid the uh, abuses that have been described. Another question, or rather it is in link with your question, when it comes to the needed techni technical uh, technicity in order to fight corruption and illicit movements, of course we need texts, we need laws, we need institutions, we need political will, but we also need the right technique, adapted technique. Of course, the issue of cash is a very important issue. I had uh, significant debates within Europe with my, f my German friends because cash in Germany has a lot more value than in other countries. So it is not easy. There are some habits uh, and we need to restrict the use of ca cash. Now, when it comes to tracking and uh, digital money. It doesn't solve everything, but it is very fundamental. So we need more and more transactions through digital equipment that will be declared and that will allow habilitated um, authorities to notice it. And of course, uh, it will facilitate the life of people as well. But what we also need is international cooperation. Because when we are talking about all these electronic things, they go beyond border and it goes around the world in just a few seconds. You can go in three offshore places within a few seconds, it will go through a trust and this trust will actually hide this transaction. So trust transparency is absolutely needed. Uh, it's uh, instrumental. It was the case with Panama Papers, otherwise we will not be efficient and the uh, international cooperation is needed. But cooperation is good. We also need the right weapons in order to make sure that this cooperation will be respected. We are working at the level of the G20 on making a blacklist of all those countries uh, that do not accept this transpiration and retortion measures will have to be applied by all countries towards those who do not agree to integrate this consensus, which is the minimum that we uh, that that our electors or our people can ask to us this is the minimum we owe this transparency and this clarity to them thank you for that um, 
just a couple more questions and then I'll open it up to the, the group here. David, I want to turn to, back to you for a minute. And this, this issue of, um, of naming and shaming and you know, being unable in the business community, or you, you, you mentioned earlier that businesses are often unwilling to speak about corruption, um, even when it might be healthy to do so, because you know, you come out and, and you're slammed. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I certainly have seen post-2008 that even CEOs who had a lot to offer and a lot to say kind of kept their heads below the parapet, um, you know, in, in many of these debates. What do you think could be done either legislatively or within the business community to actually create an environment where people could feel more comfortable coming out and just saying, look, we had this problem. Um, we want to talk about it. Here's how we're dealing with it. I mean, you know, I've, I've had any numbers of conversations with folks, say, in the oil industry, you know, CEOs that are coming up against um, uh, issues all the time that really, you know, need to talk about these things. What, what, what do you think could be done? I, I, I like the way you put the, 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 the question because I think, um, you know, who, who are the victims of corruption? Ultimately, citizens are, governments are, but also corporations are. Corporations are, are, are victims as well, those who operate on a clean basis and who want to play in, in, a, in a competitive market in a fair and straightforward way, as the minister referred to earlier. You know, they are victims as well. And I can't tell you the number of conversations I've had with business leaders where they've had to close down operations in countries where they've lost out on contracts but they've known why they've lost out and it's because somebody else has not played according to the rules and so on. I think uh, that there is, again, no sim one simple answer for this. I think some of it to do public procurement, for example. I think some countries have got um, online facilities where winning contracts are put online. So if you win and I lose, I can see why you won. Mm online hmm. and I can see the terms so I think you know digitization of, of contracting and and I, I think transparency shining a light on some of the practices I think I think speak up lines within companies uh, so that issues that people within com most people who work for most companies want to see their companies do the right thing um, sometimes they don't know how to elevate issues I think good speak up lines so that people can speak without fear of that coming back to haunt them later on um, I, I think that's a good thing obviously the management of the company then have to act on that by either having a dialogue with regulators or, 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 or other parties so I, th I don't think there's any one answer but I think there are a number of techniques that you know around the world lots of countries are doing different things and I, that's why I come back to what I was saying earlier I think there's a lot to do in sharing best practice and just squeezing squeezing the system to get mm. corruption out and shining, most of it shining a light on it. Mm. Kobus, let me ask you a final question before we open it up. Since you cover pretty much every country under the sun in your index, um, are there any international lessons that you want to call out? Any, any particularly sort of best practices that you think would be able to translate um, across many countries? And also, um, you know, are, do we unfairly blame a handful of countries and you know, maybe let others off the hook? Is there, is there anything to talk about there? Well, if I start with the last part, uh, surely um, uh, the, this so-called north-south north divide, uh, uh, that has uh, been shown as not where the issues sit. Uh, uh, even when we had the London summit um, and uh, the prime minister uh, told the queen uh, that there's fantastically corrupt countries uh, <laughs> such as Nigeria and Afghanistan, um, that gave us the opportunity to say, yes, of course, the prime minister is correct that these countries have a major problem. Um, but uh, maybe he should have added to, to the Queen that, welcome to the UK, one of the great facilitators right. of corrupt money in our property market. Mm. So um, I, I think that has shifted. So the, the time of that kind of name on that. I think we, we should move beyond that and, and look at where are the solutions where we can work together because it is a, a global problem. And, and there I think that um, uh, when, when the minister spoke I, I, I very much agreed with what he said. I think the next steps there, similar to the issues that David raised in terms of, of public procurement, is then to say how can those that are in positions of power particularly those that work with the public purse, mm. and that is all elected officials, that they have to be hold to a standard where their interest and their assets has to be in the public domain. Mm. I think that that is something which 
it, it is very strange uh, when we see some of what is happening in the US at the moment in terms of conflict of interest issues and tax declarations that don't go in the public domain because it goes against what we know mm. that uh, transparency in the public policy process is not because it is only an ethical issue. It's actually critical to a sustainable business model. Mm. And, and, and in that, uh, I think that uh, whatever we've seen it is, when you can match good policies and laws with actually also high standards of those that hold political power to proactively declare their interests and their assets. And in the issue of public procurement, we can within 2017 see the world look very differently mm. by requiring all companies that bid for public contracts to have their beneficial owners in the public domain. That's easy, it can be done. And, and that's why whilst the issues are complex, there are also solutions mm -hmm. that can bring dramatic improvements quite in the short term. And that is what I think uh, uh, one would like to see, particularly in critical areas such as issues of climate financing, such as on infrastructure. Mm. Those are ones that are really critical for the global economy. I, I would extend uh, two parts here. One was digital procurement and uh, um, one of the benefits that we saw, and like you uh, are aware, one of the mining contract which was declared void by a new government, and when they did a rebidding of it, they got 10 times more money, and that was a reverse public bidding. So it was visible to everyone who's bidding what they're bidding and what is the bid that you're placing. 10 times more money for significant large value transaction was amazing. So I do believe that digitization is a true <coughs> starting point, like Minister said, mm. and uh, obviously. Obviously, I mean, uh, like we know, the digital trail has a beauty that it can go anywhere. Mm -hmm. Like, we aren't able to trace the spam or a troll and so on, but it is digital. There is a way to reach the uh, end of this tunnel or the, the transaction, and that is one of the starting point of this. And I'll add to the next part, which is we're talking a lot of public money being a part of uh, corruption, and we're talking a lot of public and private uh, as, as if there are no corruptions in private. And I want to share this, and, and I'm mm -hmm. seeing a country, our country, which is getting more privatized and more private companies are coming, there is an equal or more corruption in private companies when private companies are dealing with other private companies. So mm -hmm. let's be conscious about it, that mm -hmm. we do not mm -hmm. label governments yeah. and bureaucrats as, yeah. a, as a corrupt people. For sure. Uh, in private companies, the, the benefits can go, and there is no logical structure. Public uh, government and all these people uh, who are in public eyes get scrutinized more often. And then, like, like, like all of us know it, it starts in that sphere where you are safe and you are doing it, and then you just extend that behavior in many other places. Yeah. So a lot of large organizations get a problem of shareholders' money being victimized, assets being compromised when there is a private corruption there too. Yeah, it's, a, it's a very good point. I'm glad that you made it. Um, so I think in the last 15 minutes, we'll open it up now to questions. And there's microphones over here. First question. And if you can just introduce yourself and um, uh, if there's anyone in particular that you want to address it to. So my, my name is Ajay. I'm from India. I I work, I'm a farmer and I work with Farmer, farmer Union. <clears throat> and I really think the historical perspective of corruption is that when uh, 5,000 years ago when agriculture started and we had priests in temples and temples and the priests told us to make offerings to the God and that's how <laughs> is the historical perspective of corruption. But I think so there's two things that uh, what you said is that tax avoidance and, and cash transactions are not corruption. I, I, what you're doing is fantastic but uh, my, my question to Mr. Standing is that if a government makes a policy where you have to do digital transactions and digital transaction companies charge you a commission for it, so you're forced to pay that commission. And because of that, digital transaction companies become billion dollar companies. Is that corrupted wealth even though no corruption has been done? Because because it's of government because of government policy, yep. people are forced to pay that commission. Yep. Kai, do you want to? And do natural resources that companies, mining companies, have natural resources? Do they go back to the state? Why should they be with the state? That's that's mm. that's uh, re rent seeking, and that's that's exactly what needs to be stopped. Go ahead. Well, well, thank you, thank you for the second part of your question. I, I'm not sure if I can say very much uh, about the first part. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I agree that if it's rent-seeking behavior that is part of rentier capitalism, mm. so that those sort of things that you're talking about definitely fit as part of rent-seeking capitalism. The, the subject I wanted to raise, and I'm cheating a bit in answering your question by it, is that one of the big subjects this year, which should be really given a lot more attention, is the systematic plunder of the commons. Mm. Now, the commons is something of our history, our public amenities, our land, our spaces, our minerals, and whatever. It belongs to us, collectively. And if you privatize the commons, and you sell them off at a knockdown price, and you give subsidies to the buyers of our commons, are you getting my point? Yes, yeah. yeah, we're I with think, you. I think you're getting my point. <laughs> and that is what is happening. Yeah. And it's a big thing. And this year, mm. why I'm making a big point of this, and I just hope someone goes out of the room and takes this point, this year happens to be the 800th anniversary of the Charter of the Forest, mm. which went along with the Magna Carta that came out in 1217, not 1215. And the Charter of the Forest was the first document to say that we, we as society have the right to the commons, a right to resist commercialization, enclosure, and commodification of our commons. And at the moment, <laughs> as I found in doing research for my book, I found, I said, this story is, should go big time because it is a systematic aspect of the corruption of rentier capitalism. So for example, large parts of London are POPs these days. It's, a, it's, a, it's an acronym that's come out. Mm. Privately owned public spaces. Oh, God. Where we, the public, <laughs> don't have a right to use those public spaces because it's owned by a multinational corporation. Oh. And they're owning more and more and making property, huge property price uh, uh, bubbles and yeah, so on. Yeah. Now, I, this part of the commons, in my view, is, is something, a, a subject that we should collectively give big attention this year because it's not been given attention in previous notes, guy. I'm seeing Thank an FT column here. Um, okay, but I want to get behind me here so I don't forget this part of the room. The gentleman here. Um, thank you very much. My name is uh, Oscar Nyema. Um, I run the Nigerian Stock Exchange. Um, there are so many companies that are listed that operate at the highest uh, standards, um, but yet operate in a country that has had this broad brush of corruption painted on it. How do you reward such uh, companies? Hmm. How do you reward such How do you reward? Does anyone want to take that on? Actually, that, that's been my problem in, in India. Mm. Uh, uh, we, we, haven't, we as a company haven't done business with any government organization. <laughs> And probably that's my reward, that's my statement that I say. Mm. That who we are, I can tell you that we never dealt with any government as a beneficiary ever. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, somewhere, uh, if we do not reward, we do not acknowledge that those who are doing good are to be respected. Mm. Incidentally, we are rewarding those who are doing bad in a way or using corruption as a mean of growth and then th we are applauding them. Mm -hmm. So I, I so much appreciate this as a question and I think uh, as a VAF or someone, we have to acknowledge uh, cleanest of the companies, even if they are young stage, if mm -hmm. not the old and sizable. That's yeah. brilliant put, actually. Interesting. I think it's part of the, the short term, long term thing, you know, mm -hmm. part of the building trust in business over the long term. I think most responsible companies take a long term view of life and part of that is you know, remembering that they're accountable for what they did 10 years ago and, uh, and not taking short-term decisions like operating um, in environments where there, there are corrupt practices. And one of the sad bits about that is I think it means oftentimes that companies just pull out of countries and products that were previously available aren't available yeah. anymore and the competition that that's created isn't available. And I think that's a, that's a challenge actually because again, I think broadcasting that and letting people know is an, is an issue because people tend not to want to talk too much about it. I wonder, and I, I'll just follow on to your question, and I don't know if this is the case in Nigeria, but I know in the U.S. there, there are studies that show that millennials are just much more sensitive to this type of thing, this perception, if a company is doing good, if it's not, and that they will actually put their you know, money on companies that are at least they perceive to be um, uh, you know, doing good for society. Um, do you all see that as a broader international? I, I'm going to say that we, we're living in an information age, mm. and this information itself is so not available, while the 
propaganda news and mm -hmm. maybe a not so sure fake news yeah. it gets propagated a lot more often. Imagine this not being talked about, how fundamentally as a society we are not bothered about those who are doing good. Mm, yeah, no, it's a great, it's a great point. Um, other question back here. Thank you very much. Khaled Janahi from Vision 3 in Switzerland. Um, listening to yourself, Kobus, and your, one of your predecessors, um, uh, Mr. German Brooks, with regards to what's going on in terms of transparency, all the work was done through companies and what the regulations there are about. But in today's world, and you said it yourself, and I'd like you to get an answer. I mean, when we accept the myth that the President of the United States is the leader of the free world, and then we accept that we should have regulations for other people to basically go and approve and follow and shame and name and everything else that you spoke about. What the hell are we doing? I mean, if the guy at the top, the leader of the free world, can get away with it without, I'm not saying lying, since transparency is very important, he's not giving the information, he's not telling anything, and part of the transparency issue is basically conflict of interest and being transparent about all these issues. Where are we? Why should we just play this game of the rest of us do the good, and the guy at the top plays with it and gets away with it. Great and question. just to follow that, to follow <laughs> that, because it takes two to tango. There is the corruptor and the corruptee. And since he's the corruptee, who is the corruptor? Would it be the 100 million or whatever they voted this guy in? I think that's mm. <laughs> provocative. I like it, Kobus. Well, um, <laughs> let me start with your last point. So we've got a declaration against corruption. Five simple things that people can do. The fifth one is to only support candidates for elective office that demonstrate transparency and accountability. Mm. So surely, yes, there's, a, there's a responsibility. To go to uh, a step back, uh, we should not take the short-term view here. Uh, I would take issue as an African about uh, appointing somebody as the leader of the free world. And I will take issue of that on two accounts. When you see the breakdown of civil liberties across the world in many established democracies over the last couple of years, including attacks on journalists, I think one should be careful what you call the free world because mm. the attack on civil liberties that we see in recent years have been dramatic. Secondly, in terms of uh, the, the taking the longer term view, uh, if issues such as human rights, social justice, uh, transparency, accountability were purely moral imperatives, then we had a huge reason to be concerned. But they are not. They are, there's a business case, and, and that's why we have seen the business community over the last five years in many areas taking huge strides forward in terms of public and proactive accountability because they realize this is not about just morally doing the right thing. This actually, it is good for business. An inward looking strategy of nepotism, of sec secrecy in public policy making that favors the few is a most unsustainable strategy mm. for growth. And that is something which will arguably, given the importance of the US, hurt many people. But ultimately, that the direct effects of that will be carried by the American public. Mm. Because bad public policy in the US will affect the US citizen arguably dramatically more. So I think one, one needs to be uh, here, also take a, a, a bit of a deep breath and say, this is not that suddenly the world has gone belly up over time. Uh, when, oh, when you look, and this is that. what I will, will finish <laughs> off on, on, on this one. When you look over the last, say, two years at, say, the 20 most uh, public uprisings around the world, Brazil, Moldova, South Africa, Romania, Guatemala, absolutely the vast majority of them have one thing in common, ordinary people saying we've had enough of corruption, we've had enough of lack of accountability and transparency of the political elected classes. Do I think that in the US this will be different in the medium to the long term? No, I don't think so. So 
that gives me reason for optimism. Great answer. Um, all right, well, we only have a couple of minutes left, so I think what I'll do is I'll just ask all of you as a kind of a flash round, let's go around and one, one action point, one thing that you think that we could do you know, in the next year uh, as people in this room, as members of the global elite, Davos community, um, to really help rebuild trust um, in ourselves and in institutions. Vijay, why don't we start with you? Um, can I come back <coughs> to his uh, remark about trust? Yep. Everybody knows, I'm in, I'm in real estate, everybody knows that you, do, you didn't like to be that identified with him. He had a very bad name. We can call Atlantic City, and there are a lot of examples. And he got away with it. How is it possible? Exactly what you said. It's incredible. We need a whole nother and, and hour we have on to, that. And we have to live with it. <laughs> we have to live with it now. Yeah. Everybody should. Okay, thank you. We all agree with that. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, so, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, well, amazing things happen in the world. Uh, <laughs> um, I, 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 I'll take this uh, a point of applauding those who are sincere and respecting and appreciating those who are sincerely doing business is one of the most important thing. If you can't punish those who are doing bad, at least applaud those who are doing good. Okay. Kobus. Uh, two things. Uh, what everybody can do. Five actions, look at our declaration against corruption. And lastly, maybe an optimistic note. I'm South African. I, in my lifetime as a uh, adult, was in prison and didn't believe I would see the end of apartheid maybe in my lifetime. Uh, it's amazing how quickly things could change when the Cold War ended, apartheid was dead. Mm. Uh, I also believe passionately that it's inevitable that the transparency train has left the station and we will live in a world, and whether that will take five years or ten world, where a lot of the issues that we are talking here about today will just be normal practices because they are ultimately have the same moral and business drivers as the end of apartheid. Had. So I, I continue to look at it. It's an inevitable process. That's where we are going. We're here. Yay. <laughs> David. Like Cobus, I'm an optimist because I think there are a lot, despite all the problems we've seen in the world, there are lots and lots of good things happening in parts of the world that had real problems and were in the vernacular basket cases uh, 20 years ago, but who've almost eliminated corruption and have got healthy, thriving economies. So I think it is possible in a 10 to 20 year period to really change the dynamics in a, in a, in a, in a country. I think also a turn at the top and leadership of organizations, given where the World Economic Forum, I think, is absolutely key, though, so whether it's government or whether it's business or whether it's civil society organizations. I think that's really important. Everybody should think about what that means for their own organization. Okay. Guy? I, I, just two points I'd like to make that haven't been discussed. One, what I found in doing this research is one of the dirty secrets of our age is the subsidy state the state that is grown by spending billions and billions of dollars, pounds, euros on subsidies to special interests. And we don't have a good, transparent view of how these subsidies are going. Hmm. And they're very regressive. We are sure about that. They don't contribute to growth. They do enrich certain elites. So that's an issue that I think is, is something that should get more, much more exposure. Hmm. And the other thing we haven't mentioned, surprisingly, is the revolving doors. Mm, sure. And particularly the revolving doors between finance and politics. How many Goldman Sachs people seem to go into top level political positions? <laughs> How, what's the probability? 11 that, Treasury secretaries. Uh, what, what is the probability that the European Central Bank is run by a Wall Street banker from the same company as the Bank of England is run by and the new Secretary of the Treasury in, in the United States? The, the revolving doors, and, and <coughs> some of that is I've had to go to the lawyers a lot because a lot of politicians are going into the companies that are being privatized on public services being private, and then going back into politics, and then going back. Mm. It's very nice business if you can get it. But it's something that the corporate ethos 
should say we're not going to have anything to do with this. Okay. Uh, and, and should be much firmer on that. Okay. Minister, last word to you. <coughs> Merci beaucoup. Je Thank you very much. I never worked for Goldman Sachs. I have no intention of uh, working for Goldman Sachs after the next elections. And uh, actually, com political commitment, the capacity of the elected representatives in a democracy, to me, it is very important to have a determination to be straight in your action. And we need to give the best possible image of the general interest. And of course, we need to prove also that we are efficient, because this is what our citizens are asking. So if we are to seek one thing, we all must show determination. And we must be very clear and do not, it, it must be tolerance zero when when it comes to corruption, conflict of interest, or when people refuse to declare their interests or their assets. But it must be, it must apply to everyone, citizens, journalists, the media, uh, politics, corporations must uh, also uh, go in this direction because it is in their economic interest. We are not only talking about morale, we are not talking about identifying the good and the evil. Of course, morale is important, but here we have uh, morale, but we also have economic efficiency, so we must be zero tolerance when it comes to corruption. Well, that's a great place to end. Thank you all to the panel, and thanks, everyone, for a great conversation.